And I want you to turn to Psalm 6. Psalm 6, and two verses there as we get underway, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 6, verses 6 and 7. David writes, I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. I'm beginning here because King David was a marvelous type, a picture, a foreshadow of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ was descended from David, at least in his earthly lineage. And uh, David's enemies greatly illustrate and anticipate Christ's enemies. Of course, Christ is the victor in ways David could never uh, have been. And his reign as a king anticipates Christ's reign one day as king of kings. And aren't we looking forward to that? And uh, David wrote um, some of the exact words uttered by Jesus Christ. For example, Psalm 22, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the Lord Jesus quoted those words verbatim from the cross. Verse 6 says, All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Listen, if you're swimming in bed because you're crying so much, that's a lot of tears. Those are a lot of tears. Crying, weeping, shedding tears are a prominent feature in the scriptures. Hagar wept over her son Ishmael when they were cast out by Abraham uh, out there in the desert, dehydrated and thirsty there in Genesis 21. Abraham wept over the death of Sarah in Genesis 23. In Genesis 27, Esau wept because his father, uh, Isaac, had no more blessing to give him. And Jacob wept at the death of his wife, Rachel, Genesis 29. Esau and Jacob wept uh, when they were finally reunited with each other, Genesis 33. Jacob wept for his son Joseph when he thought he was dead, there in Genesis 37. Genesis 42, Joseph wept privately when he learned that all of his brothers were still alive when they came down to Egypt. And then Joseph wept when he saw his father Jacob again face to face in Genesis 46. And it goes that way throughout the scripture from Genesis to Revelation. There's a lot of crying and a lot of shedding of tears recorded for us in the Bible. Experts have defined three types of tears, human tears. There are what are called basal tears, which is a, just a constant wash. When you blink your eyes, it keeps the eyes moist. There are reflex tears, when someone's chopping up an onion, or they're breathing garlic in your face, or you've got a speck of dust in your eye. It's as though the eye is flushing out uh, something that's a foreign object. And then there are emotional tears. They are triggered by pain and stress, sadness, sometimes triggered by joy. How many have ever laughed so hard your eyes began to weep and cry? I didn't think it was possible, but it happened to me several years ago. And you don't forget that that's a, a still a possibility. And the truth is, tears shed because of emotion actually have a different chemical uh, structure than normal uh, wash, normal tears. Tears are mostly just brine, that is, salt water, and not much else. But tears shed because of sorrow and sadness have some of the same uh, enzymes in them that are often found in tumors and ulcers, as though the body is trying to get rid of some thing that it considers toxic to the rest of the body. The word, the, the noun uh, tear, like the drop in your eye, and to tear, that's a verb, T-E-A-R, they're both spelled the same, they're different words, and yet I can't help but think that they're sort of connected to each other. When you shed tears of emotion and sorrow, it is as, though, it is as if something is is uh, being ripped out of you uh, or torn out of you like, a, like an animal is ripped up by an, another animal. 
And something is of you is being torn out be when tears of agony and anguish come over you that way. Uh, it can be a very agonizing experience. The Bible says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 4.15. It's necessary that God should show the or possess the same range of feelings and emotions that we possess in order to identify with us. The Bible tells us that God laughs. The Bible tells us he gets angry. He loves. He hates. He expresses a delight. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, he understands uh, the shedding of tears. And so I call this sermon today the tears of Jesus. The tears of Jesus. I want you to turn to a few places as we go, and we'll try to move along for time's sake. But first of all, turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. It's rather ironic that I would be preaching on this subject because my eyes are watering rather excessively today. <laughs> Luke chapter 19, let's begin there at verse 37 and read down through verse 44. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. The days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, uh, and thy, excuse me, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. First of all, Jesus shed tears of sorrow, there in verse 41. He knew what was going to happen to the city of Jerusalem and those among the Jews who were just about to reject him, just about to uh, refuse him. In less than 40 years, the temple would be knocked down. Uh, uh, any gold overlaid on the stones of that temple would be scraped off and stolen. And uh, the city would be ruined and, and Jews would be fleeing for their lives. The history books tell us that the Romans uh, crucified 500 Jews outside the city gates of Jerusalem. And as the Roman army decimated uh, their capital, uh, the safety of the Jewish people would once again uh, be taken away from them. And they would have no homeland to call their own, no flag, no government, no military uh, for the next 1900 years. The existence of the Jew is one of the best proofs that, of the existence of God the survival of the Jew, and the survival of the Jewish language. Both testify that there must be a God superintending and overseeing all of these things. But um, they would be uh, viewed with suspicion in every country to which they fled, and hated by Gentiles, hated by Roman Catholics, hated by Muslims, hated by anybody who was jealous of any success they might enjoy. The Bible says, he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not, there in John 1.11. Jesus was a Jew. By the way, Jesus is still a Jew. We sometimes don't think of it that way. He wasn't just a Jew, however. He was the Son of God. God manifest in the flesh, as we're told, 1 Timothy 3.16. He was the long-awaited Messiah of the nation of Israel, the prophet like unto Moses, spoken of back in Deuteronomy chapter 18. God the Father had warned the nation of Israel, Deuteronomy 18 verse 19, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, 
I will require it of him. Here the Lord Jesus understood the judgment they were about to bring on themselves, verse 44, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The New Testament, as I said, tells us he was God manifest in the flesh, God standing before them in human form. And they were getting, to, getting ready to reject him. Talk about the greatest missed opportunity in the history of the world. The Jews refused their Messiah. Hard to wrap your mind around something like that, but that's nevertheless how history unfolded. And uh, they were getting ready to uh, ask for the release of Barabbas, a murderer, and ask that Jesus be put to death instead. Um, the Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. Uh, Jesus shed tears of sorrow because he was the answer to, the prayer, to their prayers. He was their long-awaited Messiah, but they didn't see it. He spoke of the uh, to the people on the behalf of the Father, when he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. There in Matthew 23, verse 37. And he predicted the <clears throat> city's judgment. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. When Pilate was trying to find a way to let Jesus go free, he washed his hands of the matter in front of the crowd as if to say, um, I'm not involved and I'll have nothing to do with his murder. And the people shouted back to him, Matthew 27, verse 25, His blood be on us and on our children. Those weren't words that a heavenly father could listen to and take lightly. Someone has to pay for that opinion. Malachi 3, verse 6 declares, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. It is the mercy and the kindness and the love and the long-suffering and the graciousness of God that has kept the Jewish people alive. Because God made promises to Abraham which he has not completely fulfilled yet. Therefore, he has to keep them alive despite their rebellion in order to fulfill his own word. He hasn't allowed the complete destruction of the Jewish people. But until he returns, they suffer because of what their ancestors did in rejecting the Son of God. Jesus shed tears of sorrow. Secondly, go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And let's begin reading there with verse 33 down through verse 36. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. In the very shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. Verse 3 here says, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. In verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. This is the kind of human love showing uh, favoritism to those who are, were especially close. Uh, I assume that your loved ones, your family members, are much, or your dearest friends are much closer to you than the Indian guy working behind the counter at 7-Eleven, or the Arab guy working behind the counter at the gas station, uh, or the Mexican guy who's making your burrito at El Pollo Loco. I imagine that those people who are basically strangers to you are not nearly as close to you as those who mean something to you, who you love, who you're related to, who you've endured hardships and trials and sufferings with, who you've prayed for and they prayed for you when, when need be. Uh, they're much closer to you than uh, the average guy at Stater Brothers, right? <laughs> Here, Jesus shed tears of sympathy. Tears of sympathy. Uh, Christ showed this kind of love uh, to the disciple John. He wrote about himself as, and John wrote about himself as the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. In four places in the book of John. 
Christ also showed this kind of love for a brief time to the rich young ruler, Mark 10, verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, so forth and so on. This isn't to be confused with Christ's love for sinners and his divine reason for coming into the world to die for the sake of sinners. But uh, when you love someone else uh, who's close to you uh, and you lose them in death, the most painful reason for crying uh, and tears that you'll ever know. And it's because Jesus was able to cry at the death of Lazarus, we know that he really cares about us. He shows forth compassion and tenderness of heart and love and sympathy and empathy because of human loss. Thank God for that. In fact, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And I've said to you before, those two words are elegant. Jesus wept. In those two words, everything I just listed is conveyed about the person and the, the nature uh, of the Son of God. This, the, the disgusting uh, English of the JW Bible says, Jesus gave way to tears. That's some of the most ugly language you've ever read in English. But the old song says, no one understands. Like Jesus. Charles Wago wrote, uh, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And when your heart is broken, when your closest friend or, or loved one dies, when you can't sleep or eat because of grief, rather than get angry at God, that's when you'll need to stay as close to God as you can possibly stay because that's where you're going to find comfort. Jesus sheds tears of sympathy. He understands because he's been through it too. Let's suppose God were to tell you, I understand. I know what you're going through. I can empathize with you. I can identify with your problem. But if he's never gone through anything himself, how can he understand? How can he sympathize with you if he's never gone through those things? But through the person of Jesus Christ, he can now say, I understand what it means to lose a loved one. I understand when your best friends reject you and run away from you. I understand when your own family despises you and want nothing to do with you, when you're, you're an embarrassment to the family name. I understand when the religious leaders uh, are angry with you because you're taking people away from them. And, um, but through the Lord Jesus Christ, God can say, I understand. I know what you're going through. I understand what it's like. Lastly, I want you to turn, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And let's read verses 7 through 10. Hebrews 5 and verses 7 through 10. Speaking of Christ, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, call of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Thirdly and lastly, Jesus shed tears of supplication. Supplication means a humble and an earnest plea for something specifically. You state to God exactly what it is you desire of Him. It's a little different than simply praying in the sort of the generic uh, sense, the general sense as we sometimes think of it. Solomon told the Lord, Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today. 1 Kings 8, 
verse 28. The prayer was the prayer, but the cry, as Solomon mentions it, was his supplication to call out in desperation and tell God exactly what it is you need, what it is you want and desire from him. This verse before us says Jesus wanted something from the Father so much that he cried and shed tears for it. Do you think that if the Lord Jesus ever asked anything from his Heavenly Father, he would receive it? I mean, he, he was God in human form. So it's a certainty, excuse me, a certitude and certainty that if he asked something of the Father, God would grant it to him. And uh, look at verse 9 and let's see what that was. In verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Verse 7, of course, said, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. He cried and shed tears of supplication for the purpose of you being saved for sure for certain and forever. Hard to wrap your mind around that. But it came about, verse 8, by the things which he suffered. We sing, he had no tears for his own griefs, but shed drops of blood for mine. The Lord Jesus was hanging in agony on the cross at Calvary, uh, suffering a humiliating, a disgraceful death in front of a, a jeering mob of, of accusers. And while doing so, he was praying that it would result in your eternal salvation. Thank God for that. Save, save, save. I'm happy on the way, right? Save, save, save. I love him more each day. Save, save, save. I know he's mine each hour. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. The Bible says, for he hath made him, Christ... To become sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. We read, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8. And uh, he had preached as the father knoweth me, even so know I the father and I lay down my life. For the sheep, John 10, 15. He had prayed, John 17, verse 11, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. But you can be sure his prayers and his supplications with much crying and tears were answered. They were the tears of supplication for your eternal salvation. You know, the opposite of eternal security is eternal insecurity. Maybe I can lose it. Maybe there's something more I have to do to, to make sure of it, to secure it, to make it permanent, to be guaranteed of it. If there's something that you can do to add to what Jesus Christ did, what you're saying is that he basically is insufficient to save you. You're saying that he's not completely perfect and able to save you forever. He needs your help. He don't need your help. The animal offerings in the temple had to be repeated. Every time someone sinned and they were guilty, they went to repeat the sacrifice. It was a difficult and never-ending system. The animals weren't as valuable as man. Man had been given dominion over the animals, Genesis 1. Um, and every new sin required a new sacrifice. But because Christ was not only equal to man, but greater in man, in value... His death on behalf of sinners was sufficient one time only. It doesn't need to be repeated. And when he suffered, he was praying and shedding tears for you and for me. The Lord Jesus shed tears of supplication for sinners until John 19.30. He died and said, it is finished. Nothing more needs to be done to secure my salvation. No other sacrifice needs to be offered. There was nothing more that needed to be accomplished. 
uh, so that I could be saved and uh, kept saved by his, saving, by his grace and mercy for all of eternity. Verse 9 uh, in our text, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Amen. He shed tears of sorrow. He shed tears of sympathy. And he shed tears of supplication. Crying and tears may continue for a time in this life. But God promises to wipe all tears from your eyes one day. Revelation chapter 7. But the tears of Jesus have ceased. And now he stands ready to welcome anyone who comes to the Father by him. Thank God he's ready, willing, and able to save any sinner who will come to him. Thank God that a sinner today can reach back in time by faith and take all the value and the merit of Jesus on Calvary and apply it to his needy soul now. And on that basis, God washes you clean. He saves you from sin. As a matter of fact, Brother Ever and I have talked about this. A sinner in need, and actually we have two folks who can give us a, a testimony much like this, Brother Manuel and Sister Brittany. They gave me their testimony when I first met them. A sinner in need might not understand much about the Bible. He might not understand the plan of salvation. He might not understand, well, I need to admit my sin to God and understand Jesus died for me. If he knows he's in desperation, he needs God. That's enough. Amen. And based on that alone, Christ's tears of supplication uh, are able to affect salvation for all of eternity. 